Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 34 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. For 18 years, Bob Herbert was an opinion columnist for the New York Times, championing the working poor and middle class and focusing on issues of race, poverty, and social justice. He submitted his last column to the New York Times in 2011 and then joined Demos, a public policy think tank committed to building a democracy that ensures an equal say and an equal chance for all. During the last few years, he has traveled the country reporting on Americans who have been left behind in an economy that has never fully recovered from the Great Recession. The stories of these Americans are covered in his new book, Losing Our Way, an intimate portrait of a troubled America. He has been described by fellow journalists as a kind of prophet who calls our attention to the issues people don't always want to face. And the only national columnist who consistently writes about the issues in our country that matter most, yet seem to be covered least. Mr. Herbert is a recipient of numerous awards for journalism, including the American Society of Newspaper Editors Award for Distinguished Newspaper Writing and the Reidenhauer Courage Prize for Fearless Articulation of Unpopular Truths. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Bob Herbert. Um, thank you so much. It's a um, true privilege to be here in such a beautiful space on such a beautiful day. Um, when I was a kid in grammar school, and they would tell you about fall in the textbooks, they'd have photos that looked like this afternoon. Um, I consider myself uh, one of the original ink-stained wretches. Um, I, <laughs> I got into the newspaper business on the first working day of the decade of the 1970s, believe it or not. The th main thing I remember about that day was that my car wouldn't start. My father had to drive me to work. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, I stuck it out for uh, 41 years. Uh, when I left the Times in uh, 2011, I was telling people 41 years on deadline is enough. I was a columnist for 25 years, both at the Daily News and at the New York Times. But the last column that I wrote for the Times, the headline on it was Losing Our Way, which is the title of my new book. And um, the reason I wrote that column and the reason I went out to do the further research on this book is that um, this country, which has been so wonderful to me, I mean, I've led such a fortunate life. Uh, my sister and I grew up in a period when it was probably the best time to be growing up in America, those early post-war, uh, post-World War II years. Um, so I, I've been extremely fortunate. I've worked hard in my life, but, you know, it's been wonderful. And, and it seems now that times have changed. I mean, even back in the old days when there were difficult things, it seemed like we were moving in the right, in the right direction. Um, here we've been in an extended uh, difficult economy, and it, it seems like we're not moving in the right direction. And then, uh, we, you know, um, when the attacks of September 11, 2001 occurred, I was in New York, it was almost like those attacks occurred in the neighborhood. I live on the Upper West Side of uh, Manhattan. And uh, I am not a pacifist. I was in the Army a long time ago myself. I was an intelligence sergeant. And uh, so I thought that we needed to respond to the folks who had attacked us. I was in favor of going into Afghanistan and going after Al Qaeda. But I wasn't in favor of going into Iraq. And here we are now um, in 2014, almost 2015, and we're still in Afghanistan. We've re-engaged in Iraq. We're bombing in Syria, and there's no end um, in sight. 
the way I saw it at the time I left the Times was that the country seemed unwilling to engage the biggest challenges facing us in any kind of a sustained and serious way. And I thought that that was uh, really unfortunate. And one of the things that bothered me most was that a lot of the younger people coming along now did not have the same kinds of opportunities that my sister and I had when we were growing up. Um, uh, when I came out of school, jobs were plentiful. Uh, most jobs that you got had benefits. You got paid vacation. My first job at, at the Star Ledger in New Jersey, I had uh, uh, paid vacation. Uh, I had a modest uh, pension that they contributed to. I had health coverage, you know. Um, I wasn't making a salary that would make me rich, um, but it was, it was a comfortable living and there was an opportunity for, for advancement. I go around the country now and I talk to young people and they're having a very difficult time finding good jobs. And in addition to that, they're coming out of school um, with these enormous burdens of college debt, <clears throat> excuse me, that they have to pay off. And it makes it very difficult for them to get a foothold on a decent standard of living if they want to get married or if they want to have that first child or if they want to make a down payment on that first home. Uh, it, it's very tough. Uh, and it does not seem to be uh, getting better. And then there are other problems. I mean, I write a lot in this uh, book about a, an issue that people seldom think about, that's infrastructure. When you mention the word infrastructure, everybody's eyes glaze over because <laughs> I try and, try and do it in an interesting way. But it's an important, um, it's an important issue. Our uh, infrastructure um, is in many cases uh, decrepit. It's not well uh, maintained. And if we were to rebuild our infrastructure in the way that um, I'd like to see us do it, it would form a platform for the new industries going forward, and it would be a source of terrific jobs um, for people, the rebuilding our, our, our uh, bridges and roads and dams and levees and, and that sort of thing. And I just, uh, um, it, it's interesting, I'll uh, read a little bit from the book because when I talk about infrastructure, I actually talk about that uh, terrible bridge collapse here in Minneapolis. So the book actually opens uh, in Minneapolis, if you can believe it. Uh, but uh, so those are uh, some of the issues that I, that I focus on. I focus on the economy and employment in the book. I focus on infrastructure and the need to rebuild it and using infrastructure as a source of good jobs. I also talk about education and the role of poverty in holding kids back. Uh, from uh, uh, serious academic achievement. And I make the case that we're never going to really going to get anywhere with our issues here at home if we keep fighting these endless debilitating wars um, overseas. So I'm just um, going to read a little bit about um, the very beginning of the book when we talk about infrastructure. Uh, and this is in uh, Minneapolis back in 2007. Mercedes Gordon glanced out at the highway, which she could see from her third floor office on the sprawling campus of the Best Buy corporate headquarters in Richfield, Minnesota. It was after five, rush hour, but the traffic wasn't too bad. She didn't really care. She'd recently been promoted by her company, Accenture, which did employee relations work for Best Buy, and her raise had kicked in that day. I wasn't in any hurry, she would later recall. I was in a great mood. I thought about picking up a bottle of wine on my way home and maybe celebrating my raise with my fiance. There was nothing out of the ordinary about that day. Nothing at all. August 1st, August 1st, 2007. Newspapers were reporting that the Italian movie director Michel Michelangelo Antonioni had died. Presidential candidate Barack Obama, a long shot for the Democratic nomination, was meeting in Washington with members of the 9-11 Commission. A pair of senators, Chris Dodd of Connecticut and Chuck Hagel of Nebraska had scheduled a press conference to discuss the sorry state of the nation's infrastructure. But few reporters were interested and the press conference was a bust. The ride home to Minneapolis at rush hour usually took 25 to 30 minutes. That particular stretch of Interstate 35 West was given a small taste of fame in the movie Fargo when a pair of characters come around a mild curve and watch the Twin Cities skyline slide dramatically into view. The sun was off to my left, Mercedes said. The traffic was moving okay for a while, but then construction work on the highway slowed it down. Four lanes of highway had been reduced to two and traffic slowed to 10 miles per hour. 
Mercedes passed the Metrodome Stadium on her left, an architectural eyesore that was the home to the Twins and the Vikings. <laughs> there is an exit just before the bridge that leads to an alternate route, and Mercedes considered it a mental roll of the dice. As she remembered it, I thought about it, but in a split second, or however long it was, I just said, and then she said a bad word, I'm taking the bridge. So there I was in all that traffic. I got over probably the first half just fine, maybe a little more than halfway. And then, all of a sudden, I saw the pavement ripple like a wave. It looked like an ocean wave almost, like a tide coming in. It was just up and down. I thought, what is this? And then, in a horrifying burst of clarity, Mercedes realized, with the traffic still moving slowly, helplessly forward, that the bridge was going down. And we all know um, what happened. I was mentioning a few moments ago, 13 people tragically died in that um, bridge collapse. But when uh, you look at what actually happened, it's almost a miracle that, m that more people uh, weren't killed. The, um, the, well, I just want to, just a little bit of the experience of what Mercedes went through. I, in, in her words, she said, I plummeted, I think, around six or seven stories. I had this feeling of weightlessness for a moment, and even though it was a bright, sunny day, everything went dark, I think because of all the dust and debris of the bridge falling apart. On the way down, everything got dark. I don't know, I guess my eyes were closed part of the time. It was dark, and I could feel the descent and I had no idea where I was going, where I was headed. It was just this abyss, and I just thought, what is going to happen? I just prayed that things weren't going to smash me to bits. There was so much concrete falling apart, and so much steel bending, and there were cars flying everywhere. Well, what happened to Mercedes is uh, she landed on the far side of the riverbank, crashed into the retaining wall. Another car landed upside down on her trunk, if it had landed on her roof, she, she would have been killed. The point of telling her story is to try to dramatize uh, the, the state of our infrastructure and the fact that it has this uh, often, frequently in our history, a terrible impact on ordinary people. We don't, pay, we don't pay very much attention to it. And then if you'll just bear with me a little bit, I just want to tell you, to give you another example of things, because everybody knows about the uh, Minnesota bridge collapse. Uh, but there are these other things that go on that people tend not to know um, so much about. So here it says, there are endless infrastructure nightmares in America. On a quiet Thursday evening in September 2010, a natural gas pipeline exploded in a residential neighborhood of San Bruno, California, about 12 miles south of San Francisco. The blast was thunderously loud and the ground shook as in an earthquake. An enormous fireball, 30 to 40 stories high, roared through the neighborhood. Whipped by winds coming off San Francisco Bay, the towering flames became a firestorm that spread with shocking speed, destroying well-kept suburban homes by the dozens. Trees went up in flames. Cars, trucks, and station wagons burned. Streets and sidewalks buckled and melted in the tremendous heat. Captain Charlie Barringer of the San Bruno Fire Department told the Los Angeles Times, I thought a 747 had landed on us. So um, very few people actually know about that. And there are other uh, natural gas pipelines that have exploded with uh, tragic uh, results. We all saw what happened in New Orleans. Um, we knew for a long time that the levees and the flood walls in New Orleans could not sustain a Category 3 or a Category 4 a hurricane, and yet we would not repair them properly. And of course, we saw what happened when Hurricane Katrina uh, struck. So these are penny-wise and pound-foolish policies that maybe are the product of denial. And um, somehow, if we're going to start to turn things around in this country and begin to be the, the, the country we're capable of being, we have to pierce this denial and begin to um, get our uh, act together. Uh, I think the biggest challenge facing this country is the lack of adequate employment for all the men and women who want and need to work. And um, it's not just a matter of not enough jobs, which happens to be true, 
but it's also that so many of the jobs that we create are not very good jobs. We pay uh, attention to those monthly unemployment numbers that come around and uh, the politicians like to say, well, this is good news, and if the unemployment uh, number is coming down, well, sure, it's good news, but it's not very good news. I mean, it's better than going up. But what the unemployment numbers don't tell us is how many of those jobs that are being created are part-time jobs, how many of those jobs are low-wage jobs, how many of those jobs are temporary in nature or, or otherwise contingent. And it also doesn't tell us about the enormous numbers of Americans who have been out of work for so long that they've stopped looking for jobs. And then they're unemployed, but they're not counted as unemployed. So it's a, it's a, it's a number that monthly jobless figure is a number that gives us a false picture of what's actually happening um, in the country. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got into this fix about jobs. Um, you know, we know about, we hear a lot about globalization, and of course there have been remarkable technological advances, so we understand that things are being done with computers and uh, with machines that used to require uh, human beings uh, to do. But that's not the, um, that's not the, the only problem, and those are problems that could be fixed if we weren't so irresponsible in other areas. And the truth is that America is sort of trapped in a catch-22, and, and I'll explain that. There's no way for the middle class in America to prosper, or even survive, fr frankly, in the absence of well-paying jobs. Uh, that's because we have a uh, consumer economy. Uh, consumer spending is 70% of the economy in, in America. If, if, if we don't have money to uh, go to the mall, uh, to buy new homes, to furnish new homes, to take vacations, then the corporations suffer, their business goes down, then they can't create, they can't expand, they can't create new jobs, so it, it affects everybody. So we really need Americans working, and we really need Americans working at good jobs. But corporate America, as I point out, obsessed with stock prices and bonuses, was not paying attention to that. By the 1990s, and this is long before the Great Recession occurred, employers had lost whatever inhibitions they might once have had about firing workers. And there was a fellow by the name of Alan Sinai, who was the chief global economist at the research firm Decision Economics, and he explained the corporate thinking to the New York Times. And this is a quote. He said, American business is about maximizing shareholder value. You basically don't want workers. You hire less, and you try to find capital equipment to replace them. Well, you can keep doing that. Corporate America can keep doing that. <clears throat> but it's going to leave us all in effect. And ultimately, it's, it's sort of like with the infrastructure, penny wise and pound foolish. You'll have those short-term profits. You'll have stock increases. You'll have a fair number of people getting extremely wealthy. But it's not sustainable. In the long run, we, we come up against things like the Great Recession, the housing foreclosure crisis, and that sort of thing. And I'm telling you, this is, we are now five years, more than five years after the official end of the Great Recession, and the economy is still in trouble. It's still stagnant. We don't have a cushion now for the next downturn, and that next downturn is coming because it always comes. We've been told that education is the answer to our problems, and we have a lot of uh, corporate-style reformers who have a lot of ideas about how to improve education, public education, in this country. But I think that that really misses the point. The real problem with public education in the United States is poverty. If you just take the kids in America from middle class and upper middle class families, and you take their test scores, and you compare those test scores to the test scores of youngsters in other countries around the world, in Europe, in uh, Norway, in Finland, in Japan, American uh, public school kids would grade out at or very near the top in almost all categories. The reason the United States does not do better in relation to the rest of the world is because there are so many poor children in the United States. And the poor kids 
drag those test scores down. Um, those other countries do not have the same levels of child poverty that the United States has. And um, I want to explain why those poor kids are having so much trouble. It's not because um, they're incapable of learning. I mean, I'd obviously be the last person in the world to say that. But I went out and did my homework, and one of the places I went to was Pittsburgh to see what was going on in the public uh, uh, school systems down there. The governor there, Tom Corbett, had cut nearly a billion dollars in state aid to the public schools. And one of the people I interviewed when I was down there, I spent the day with this woman, was a principal, school principal named Dion um, Arrington. And um, she was trying to tell me most of the kids in her school, um, more than 90%, came from um, uh, very impoverished or very low-wage um, families. And they had, those kids, had all kinds of problems. Arrington told me about a time three years before I had visited her during her first year as principal when she led a group of eight and nine-year-olds into the school library. I thought they would enjoy it, she said. We didn't have a librarian, but there were books all around us, and I just assumed from my own experience that the children would love to come in and read. I was so wrong, she said. They were not at all interested. In fact, they were mad, very angry and upset that they had to be there. These children were angry that the school principal was taking them into the library. They weren't used to books, she said. They couldn't see the point. In most cases, there were no books in their homes, and for many, there had been no history of adults reading to them when they were very little. So we've had to work hard to develop a love of reading among our children, and that's been one of my biggest emphases. But there were even more serious problems that these kids had. During a particularly cold stretch of weather, children were showing up at school without warm clothing. It was like the Arctic out there, one teacher told me. The kids were trying to tough it out. They'd come in shivering so badly, it was pitiful. Arrington, the principal, and some of the teachers, using their own money, bought coats, hats, and gloves for the youngsters who needed them. Then there, were the, uh, the, then there was the continuing problem of children coming to school when they were sick. In most of those cases, Arrington said, the parents couldn't afford to take time off from work. Given a choice between sending their youngsters to school with the flu or worse and losing two or three days pay, the parents, in most cases, they were single mothers, sent their kids to school. Some of the parents, even worse problems, some of the parents were drug addicted or alcoholic. Some were seriously ill, the parents themselves. Some were deathly ill. A lot of the parents, uh, parents passed away. Some homes were plagued with violence. Self-styled reformers are often willfully blind to these problems that these children bring with them into the classroom. Our children have serious stresses to deal with, Arrington said. We had four fires over the Christmas break, fires. She paused as if amazed herself. Four fires, she said. So what happens? With all their possessions gone, the children don't come back to school. As soon as we hear about it, we get our counselor out to the family. We have to get clothes for the children, get them all ready again, all over again uh, for school. Three of my teachers took children out shopping for clothes. Staff members use their own money. They'll take up a collection. And as principal, I try to match what the staff comes up with. Now, I'm telling you, you can have whatever thoughts you might have about why these families are poor or what these families uh, should be doing. Those are all legitimate discussions. But there is, uh, I think, a strong need to acknowledge that the reality is that these children do come to school with these problems, with these stresses. Um, sometimes they're depressed, as the principal said. And it makes it almost impossible to learn at any kind of an optimal level. So it doesn't matter how many tests you give these youngsters. You know, you can give them tests in the first month and then month after month after that, and then you can increase it and say, all right, we're gonna test them every week, week after week after week. That's not gonna work. You can raise the standards. I am absolutely in favor of high, high standards. I think across the board, uh, we uh, are, uh, have a very low bar in this country in, in a lot of different areas. So I'm in favor of higher standards. 
But if you just raise the standards on these youngsters without figuring, figuring out a way to have them, help them uh, meet those standards, you haven't really done anything. And so I think that we're in denial about a lot of our problems in this country. Um, I'm really unhappy personally that it has come to this state of affairs. But the thing that perhaps bothers me the most is not the existence of all these problems, but what I think is the failure of leadership from our elected officials to put together any kind of a reasonable path to begin engaging these problems. And I think that there has been a breakdown of leadership on both the left and the right. I think it encompasses both the Republicans and the Democrats. I think we see it at the national level, but also at the state and local level in states and cities and towns and rural areas that I have visited all across this country. And I've been watching this for so long, long before the Great Recession. You can, you know, you can go back to George W. Bush. You can go back to some of the things that occurred in the, in the Bill Clinton uh, era. And I think that what has happened is that our politicians have formed an alliance with our corporate leaders and with our uh, financial leaders in this country. And they pay attention to the interests of those leaders. Those are the very, the very wealthy sector of this society, but that's only a small segment, a tiny segment, really, of our population. And their interests are different from the interests of ordinary working men and women in America. The, the folks who have to raise the families, who have to meet that monthly mortgage, who would like to put together uh, a, a, a decent amount of money so that they can have a reasonable retirement. And then most especially, those young people who are, co are coming out of our colleges and universities who have a right in this, in this country, which is a very wealthy country, in my view, to, lead, to have the kinds of opportunities that my sister and I had when we were growing up in the 1950s and 60s. And since, if I'm correct, that this leadership um, has uh, been failing for so long, the question arises, well, what do we do about it? And I think that it is time for ordinary citizens uh, to take their own fate into their own hands. I think it is really important for ordinary Americans to become more civically engaged in these very important issues of our time. And when I talk to people around the country, they tend to say, well, you know, what kind of clout could I have? What could I do? Who's going to listen to me? Um, the press won't pay any attention to me. I can't get heard by our elected officials. I don't have the kind of cash that's, uh, uh, that's needed to make the kind of financial donations that will get the ear or the eye of the politicians. And I tell them, and I don't think that this is pie in the sky, that the great, some of the greatest issues in the history of America started with very ordinary people who just got fed up with an intolerable status quo. If you go back to the very early days of the labor uh, movement, long, long ago, when, when people were working in steel mills and working in the mines and working in factories at uh, absurdly low wages, in dangerous conditions and that sort of thing, at some point, some of those workers said, enough already, and you got a labor movement started that changed the quality of the work environment and ultimately standards of living in this country. In the civil rights movement back in the 1950s and 1960s, when, for example, the youngsters moved into uh, the segregated lunch counters and just began sitting in, who would have thought that they could have uh, any clout at all? No one was paying serious attention to them. They weren't on television every night um, in, the in the beginning. A lot of them were in rural areas uh, of the South where the big media outlets in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles weren't even aware of what was going on. But they said, enough is enough. And little by little, the civil rights movement grew, and eventually that changed the face of this nation. And then I remember as a, um, a young guy, uh, the early days of the women's movement. And I remember that the feminist leaders were ridiculed in those days. If they got any coverage at all, it was mocking coverage. 
But women were obviously not getting a fair shake in this society. Those feminists, they, it, it didn't matter that they were mocked. It didn't matter that it took a long time for them to get even a few small victories. They stayed with it. They did not stop. They would not be denied. And eventually they prevailed too. And I will tell you, and I'm sure you all know, that the status of women in this country is a lot higher now than it was back in the 1950s. So I'm urging Americans, as I go around the country talking to them, to become more civically in engaged. To, uh, it's important to vote, but voting is not enough. There comes a time when Americans have to begin to put together a movement. I'd like to see it around the issue of uh, a fairer shape for America's workers, whether you're in favor of labor unions or not. I think everybody would be in favor of uh, working men and women uh, being paid a decent, be decent wage and hopefully getting some decent benefits. So I'm going to leave it there, and then I guess we're going to open it up, and I'll try and answer as many of your questions as I can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Herbert. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister of Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is journalist and political analyst and public advocate Bob Herbert. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our forum on Thursday, November 13 at noon, when Sister Simone Campbell will speak on the topic, Nuns on the Bus, the Call to Compassion. Our events are always free and open to the public, and further information can be found at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Bob Herbert, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present questions from our audience. First question has to do with uh, your sense of the exceptionalism of this time in American history. Uh, it, we're, it's a favorite uh, image, I think, to talk about this particular era as being a, especially troubled. Uh, our time is the worst time. Uh, do, you, do you subscribe to that, or, or is this par for the course in American history? We just happen to be located in our time looking at it. I don't think that the, <laughs> these are pretty tough times, but. I don't think these are the worst of times. Um, you know, I gave a, a talk, this is a, a few years ago, I gave a talk on a campus, and uh, I can't even remember what the topic was, but it was about some of the challenges that we're facing. And uh, after the talk, a young woman came up to me, a student, and she said, um, I was really moved by your talk, but, uh, but it was depressing. And she said, is there anything that we can do and I actually was kind of horrified. I mean, I wanted to, you know, I hope I could, you know, maybe uh, enlighten some people on some aspects of some problems, but I don't want to bring our college kids down. I certainly don't want to depress anybody. So she said, um, is there anything to be optimistic about or, to be, or is there any reason to be hopeful? And I said to her, I had to think off the top of my head, and I said to her, well, look, this is not the Great Depression. And we got through the Great Depression, and we came out stronger than ever. This is not the um, World War II, uh, tremendously uh, difficult period for nearly all American, uh, American families, and we got through that. I said, this is not the Jim Crow era, and yet we got through that too and put together a better country. I think we will get through this. We're not, right now is not as bad as any of those eras I just mentioned. I think we will get through this, but I think we're losing time in taking those first steps to begin to turn things around. You talked about the importance of voting, and one of our listeners asked, we have the worst voter, voter participation rate in the Western world. How do we change this? I think that um, it's going to be very difficult to change it, and I think the reason that our voting rates are low, and, and they are abysmally low, I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, I think one reason is because an awful lot of voters think that their vote 
doesn't really mean much, that it doesn't count, that they cast their ballots, but things don't really change or things don't move in the direction that they'd like to see them move. I think that's one problem. I think another problem is um, sort of the um, uh, poor and low income uh, people who really, in many cases, don't have voting uh, on, their, on their mind. I mean, there was a, 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 a vast increase in poor, a sharp increase in poor and African American voting uh, because Barack Obama ran uh, for two terms, but I don't think that that's going to be um, sustained. So we need to get the word out to low income people that above all it's the low income people who, who have the most at stake and we need to get those voting, um, voting rates up and up on, on a, in a permanent way. Any comments about uh, recent efforts to uh, re require voters to meet certain uh, <laughs> yeah, I have mandates in order to vote uh, and <laughs> the interpretation of that as a restriction of voting? One of the, um, w when I say uh, the, that we've been going backwards in so many areas after, after areas after we had made so much progress, I mean, I, I think this, this is an amazing country. It has been an amazing country. I think it's still an amazing country, and that makes it even more difficult to accept that we would be backsliding. And one way in which we've been sliding backwards is uh, the erosion of voting rights, which was one of the um, great victories of the civil rights era. And the Supreme Court has even actually uh, essentially cut the legs out from under the Great Voting Rights Act of 1965. Moving over to the area of economics, can you comment on the practice of multinational companies recently, such as our own Minnesota-based Medtronic, shifting their headquarters from the United States to lower tax nations? Yeah, um, obviously I'm opposed to that. Uh, corporations, uh, like every all the rest of us, need to be paying their fair share, their part of um, the overall wider American uh, community and we should be all in, in this together. But that goes to the issue of what I was saying about the, the, they can do this uh, because it's legal, because our, our national policies allow them to do this. And what that means is that the um, uh, highest ranking leaders in this country are once again looking out for what they perceive to be the interests of the very rich and the very powerful. And that helps. Uh, that 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 hurts the rest of us. It helps them, but it hurts the rest of us. When those companies don't pay their fair share in taxes, who do you think makes up the gap? Look in the mirror. You, you're probably aware that uh, Minneapolis has one of the greatest rates of disparity between low-income students and students of affluence or students of color and white students in our public education system. Can you comment, uh, if you had a, a kind of a magic wand and could wave it over a public education system like ours, what would you see change to make this uh, disparity begin to disappear? Um, there are a couple of things if I had the, the, the magic wand. One, um, we would have to figure out a way to get adequate financial and other supports into all the schools, that we, the, the, we, all kids should go to a decent school with decent uh, teachers and decent facilities, and that includes um, facilities for extracurricular activities and science labs and computers and, and, and that sort of thing. But it goes beyond education, as I had mentioned. I think that we really do have to engage the issue of poverty, and we have to engage the issue of poverty on two fronts. One is that we have to try and figure out um, policies that would help lift people out of poverty. I mean, the best way, of course, is, is a job. Employment is, is the best way. But we also need to address some of these other issues. Two, and um, this becomes more difficult to, for people to talk about, especially uh, liberals, is that I do think that in, uh, we have to uh, begin to make some changes in the behavior and some of the goings on in our poorer communities, and we have to do something about family breakdown. People really don't want to talk about that too much. So um, you can't just wave a magic wand and say there's a magic public policy that's going to address all of these issues. Public policy can only address some of those issues. The rest of those issues have to be changed by the folks themselves.
Drilling down a bit on the uh, matter of public policy and your comments about leadership, who are some of the leaders, political leaders particularly I'm thinking of here, who are uh, getting at these issues in the way that you think is appropriate? I think that there are um, a lot of politicians, elected officials, who have good voting records in the sense that they vote for policies that are similar to the things that I think they should be uh, voting for. But I don't think that there are any real leaders. Leaders are people who galvanize the population, who galvanize the community, who get people inspired to go out and work not for them, but work with them. And I must tell you, I don't see it. And across a broad front, I don't see it. I don't see it happening in politics, in either Democrat or, or Democratic or Republican parties. Um, I don't see it happening in the African American community, where there's a great deal of distress and in, in an absolute absence of effective leadership. I don't see it happening in the, um, among women. I, I think that there are some really big issues facing women, challenges facing women, that we don't even talk about very much uh, anymore. But there's not like a great deal of leadership there either. So that's part and parcel of all the problems that I've been talking about today, the absence of leadership. All right, let's try, if we can't find a, a leader to point to, what about an organization? Are there any organizations you would lift up who are really working hard and effectively on matters of inequality? Yeah, uh, I, think, uh, I think that there are um, a, a lot of them. I think uh, Demos, which is not well known, uh, the organization that I'm affiliated with, and I'm not doing their work, I, I, I am privileged to be a distinguished senior fellow, so I'm not patting myself on the, on the back here. Demos uh, is doing tremendous work, and I hope to uh, help heighten their prof profile some, somewhat. I think uh, the Legal uh, Defense Fund is doing uh, a lot of good work. I think the organizers of uh, low-wage workers, restaurant workers and big box workers, who have been uh, uh, out there um, uh, in some cases doing uh, wildcat strikes and, and otherwise organizing in an effort to raise uh, uh, the minimum wage, I think that's been helpful. So I do think that there are, um, there are people out there working on climate change, for example. So I do think that there are a lot of people working on a lot of good issues, but there is no one really pulling any of this stuff together in a way that allows us to, to move forward um, in any kind of substantial way. Shifting the topic now to a conversation about race and racism in America, would you predict something happening out of Ferguson, the incident there that's going to gain some momentum in the life of our culture? Um, that is a, that's a tough question, and, and, and my answer is that that can go either way. When um, uh, emotions are running high, as, 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 as we see in Ferguson and also in, um, in other areas, and they're not really paid attention to. Um, what can happen is what happened in the um, great days of the civil rights movement, where the uh, momentum just kept increasing. The movement got larger and larger. It was a, um, a, a peaceful movement, and as I mentioned, it changed the face of America. It can go that way, or it can go another way. I'm old enough to remember 1967. In those days, I lived in Montclair, New Jersey, which was just a few miles outside of Newark, New Jersey. Newark erupted in terrible riots in 1967. So did Detroit. Neither of those cities has ever fully recovered from those riots. So I can't make a prediction on what will happen. I'm certainly not predicting uh, riots, and I am certainly not in favor of violence. But I think that we have to pay close attention because these things are volatile and they can go either way. Uh, w the legacy of our first black president, w mm. what do you imagine that it will be? Uh, of lost opportunities, missed opportunities, or great achievements? I think uh, it's a, it's a um, mixed bag. I have been um, quite critical of Barack Obama um, more than my wife would like. Uh, <laughs> She's not here today, so go ahead. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, the, um, 
We have to remember the terrible hand he was dealt when he became president. We were faced with um, the possibility of plunging into another Great Depression. So the first order of business was to keep us out of uh, a depression, and uh, he, he and others uh, did that. And he was the leader, and he deserves credit for that. Um, I thought that that was an opportunity to do something real about the extraordinarily important issue of employment in this country. And I thought um, that Barack Obama and the Democrats did not provide the leadership that was necessary to take us down that road. I think another missed opportunity was the bank bailouts. I was in favor of bailing out the banks. Credit was frozen. We absolutely had to uh, bail the banks out. But I thought there should have been strings attached to the banks. There was no reason. Um, not to, uh, to give, uh, in addition to help for the banks, uh, help to distressed homeowners, for example, just to, just to take one example. We gave the help to the banks, but we gave very little help to um, distressed homeowners. So that was another missed opportunity. The banks that were too big to fail then are even bigger now. That makes no sense whatsoever. You're, if you're too big to fail, that means you should be broken up. That means you're too big to exist. They're even, even bigger than they, um, uh, than they were then. I think Obamacare is going to prove to be a net plus, despite all the uh, controversy. Uh, so I think that that will um, uh, be considered a, a plus in terms of his legacy. Overall, though, f over um, the course of uh, his presidency so far, I think that there is a sense of disappointment, a, a sense of a feeling of uh, what might have been. It's difficult to say in the face of so much obstructionism by the Republican Party. I mean, they, they, the Republican Party has very, really tried to uh, have this fella fail. It's difficult in the face of all that obstructionism to say what he really could have achieved. But I think, nevertheless, there's this sense of what might have been. Historically, in this country and many others, change has been led by the young. On your travels across the country, are you encouraged by uh, youthful movements for change, or are we missing out on that? Yeah. <laughs> that was an articulate response. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, I may have been spoiled coming up in the 50s and 60s where we were protesting about something every other Tuesday, you know, so um, I remember having mixed feelings. I, was, I got drafted in the big buildup to Vietnam but did not go to Vietnam. They sent me to Korea for 14 months and so uh, I was lucky. I lost a lot of friends in Vietnam. When I came out, uh, I had a lot of friends who were protesting the war and I, I felt torn. I had a lot of buddies in the service, some of whom were still in Vietnam, and then I had other friends who were protesting the war and that sort of thing. But people were protesting everything. I mean, they wanted women's rights. They were protesting the war in Vietnam. Um, there was this, uh, the civil rights movement and stuff. And I don't see that kind of ferment today. I don't see that kind of energy and passion. And I have to tell you that I, uh, I don't understand it real well. I, I, you know, I wish kids would put down the devices a little bit and stop tweeting for a moment and um, and the kids themselves become more engaged in, in these issues. I've actually been giving a few lectures that has the title, uh, Tweet Less, Kiss More. I think that we need, <laughs> we need to, um, just, I'm not anti-technology by any means, uh, but I don't think technology is the be all and end all. I'd like to see uh, young people more fired up. I think just a little bit of response as a father of children yeah. who, young people who use technology, that in fact is the organizing tool of this new generation and uh, we, we need to kind of let them, I think, back off and back off and let them use their technology in ways that will be beneficial to all of us. Uh, I would be perfectly willing to do that. I want to see a little bit of those benefits um, you okay. know, and, and then I'll be... <laughs> Did you support Occupy Wall Street? I did. I thought that people, um, I thought Occupy Wall Street kind of got a bad rap. People said, um, well, you know, they're not really achieving anything, and they're not even identifying their goals, and they don't have elected leaders and stuff like that. The, the, the beauty of Occupy was that they brought these big issues before the public in a way that had not happened before. I thought it was up to the rest of us 
to try and come up with the policy solutions, not Occupy. So I think we were the ones that uh, dropped the ball, not the movement itself. We have time for one more response. And you, you've got a, perhaps a, a perspective on America that many of us have not been able to, to get to, given your, your coverage of, uh, uh, in newspaper work and across the land recently. Are you hopeful about America? I am hopeful with reservations. Um, there was a question of whether, you know, we're in something approaching the worst of times. Um, I don't think so. But the challenges are so enormous. I talked about employment. Um, we see the potential um, with, with the Ebola crisis. Perhaps it can be contained, but this is an indication that there are, you know, that that sort of thing can occur. Um, we're back in Iraq and uh, Syria with ISIS or, or ISIL. Uh, and we have uh, this tremendous um, political gridlock in Washington. So I think there is a possibility for much worse times to come, which is why I think it is so important for ordinary voices to be raised, to be heard, to put the, po to put the pressure uh, on the politicians. Thank you, Bob Herbert. Thank you very much. Thank you.